Oh, I think she'd be very taken, and if she had the strength to write a, a response, I mean, she would be like uh, her. She would write a handwritten letter on blue stationery, like she wrote to Sidney Eisenberg, the psychiatrist, uh, young intern then, who wrote her a very charming and devoting, devoted letter in response to Tennessee Williams' letter to the editor, as I recall, and. And it was, you know, he said, we became dear, dear friends, and she wanted me to come right then and see her. I think were Carson alive today and, and had a degree of health that she could sit up in her bed and receive people, she'd do it until her housekeeper or a doctor said, now, Mrs. McCullers is getting tired. We're going to have to cut this short. I, that's the way she would be, and I, I, I am convinced that Carson would have been an extraordinarily giving person, and as she still is, you see, as she is affecting, continues to affect all of our lives. But uh, I do remember that it, it Kim McCormick, uh, my editor, uh, you know, I have his editorial notes on that original manuscript. And then I don't remember how much I had to cut it down, but it must have gone down from, you know, over 900 pages to something more reasonable, like, you know, 700 in manuscript at least, because well, it's a big book. Let's let's talk a little bit more about your conversation with Janet Flannard. I mean, did, did she she supported Reeves, and she was so close to Reeves. Well, did she discuss Carson? I cannot remember to what extent she did. I mean, by then, of course, Carson had had flown the coop, shall we say, and and uh, she was, you know, to Carson in every important way. Reeves was already dead. I think that's why she couldn't deal with the body or his remains. Is that somebody else would do that? that that wasn't something that she would do. And Janet Flanner did have a friendship with Reeves, and, and uh, as, as she said to me, she said, of course, all these flowers that I received were charged to Carson. <laughs> and he said, she's, I mean, it was like there was this ambivalence of, of, of love, of flowing out of love. I mean, Janet, I think, was a very, you know, she was a very giving person. She's also a smart lady. And she didn't have a lot of time for foolishness. And, and you know, on one hand, there was some foolishness involved with Reeves. And it was not, I mean, he was not a responsible man owning up to his debts. And she did acknowledge that. But there was something about Reeves that was so, you know, so fetching. I mean, up close to his death. And, I remember when I talked with uh, Bessie Brewer Poor, uh, Henry Varnum Poor's widow, and she, uh, her daughter just died recently, as a matter of fact. And uh, when I talked with, with her in her home, she said, you know, um, you asked me why it was that, that we all, you know, why Reeves remarried Carson when they'd had such a wretched time together. And she said, well, you know, we're just, she said, I think it was, the way Reeves put it was, we're all just, you know, bees swarming around, you know, the, the queen bee, in effect, that was Carson. And there was, I mean, I think that Reeves acknowledged to, to Bessie uh, uh, Poor that, you know, he was, he was just drawn to her, that there was no, that there were, there must have been a great love between them, but Bessie, you know, just thought that Carson had such a, a such magnetism, and it was not in everyone's best interest that they swarmed around her, but they did. And I've often thought, and you know, you haven't asked me this, but I've often thought I was very fortunate not to have known Carson personally. I would have loved her. I would have been one of those hangers-on. I would have wanted to read to her and fetch things and tote. And I interviewed several people who did fetch and tote for her, and they said it got to be very difficult. And 
and I would have not been knowing her as a biographer. I would have just known her as you know, whatever kind of friend I could have been at that stage. And so a biographer has to have an emotional distance in putting together all of the materials that are so fetching personally and to try to sort them out and, and not and not be that clinging hanger on that there has to be some objectivity, but I do think that in my biography, you know, my love, my dedication was is apparent today. Well, I re first I have to go back and tell you that uh, in my research of Paul Bowles, Carson McCullers uh, emerged again because uh, he and Jane visited, or they were staying in the same hotel in Paris, uh, and this is before Bacchelier. And, and they liked being with her. You know, they often took their meals into Carson's room and, and just sat and talked with her. But as soon as she got under the influence uh, of her alcohol, it says, we just, we finally, we just had to, to pull away. Now, when they went uh, out into the countryside and Reeves found his, established his wine cellar, um, he still, I mean, I think Reeves felt very much a responsibility that he was Carson's guardian in the sense that somebody had to take care of her. And at the same, and part of being able to take care of her was also having a haven, i.e., his own addiction to alcohol, and he could go out and and drink and not not be observed, not be not disturbed. And I remember the story, and I hope I'm remembering it with a fair degree of accuracy, uh, when uh, he tried to hang himself from a pear tree in the orchard. And when, you know, and Carson heard the great crack of the limb and went out to see what, and this is my story as I recall being told it, and I don't, maybe Jack Fuller Love told me this, um, that Carson's comment was, oh, Reeves, our best pear tree, oh, please be more careful. And, you know, and he pointed up the, the, um, the things in the barn, you know, see this you know, beam, Carson, we're going to hang ourselves. And, and it was sort of like, who's going to be around to take care of you? And so let's do it together. And then when he uh, was taking her to the hospital and she recognized that it was not the way to the American Hospital in Newley, and Reeves, well, where are we going? Why are we doing this? Why are we going out of our way? And that's when, uh, according to, uh, I guess this again was Jack Fullerlow, you know, where she said it made me very nervous when I looked down and saw a hemp, a roll of rope, because Reeves did say, now Carson, see this rope, we're going to stop in and buy a, a, a last bottle, I guess, of brandy, and we're going to drink it, and we're going to go into the woods, and we're going to hang ourselves. And so that's when he went in to get the liquor, and she leaped out of the car and flagged down a passing motorist, and off she went. And at that moment, I think, once Carson, in her almost hysterical state, was able to, to get on a plane and leave, and remember she went up to old uh, Screamer Mountain to visit Lillian Smith and her companion, Paula Schnelling. And then when, and that's where she was when she got the word that Reeves had, had killed himself. And she went down then to see Dr. H.V. Uh, Cleckley, who was in Augusta. And he said, you know, Carson, you don't, there's nothing you need to do, just come and be with us for a while. And Dr. Cleckley himself said to me, he said, I was surprised that Carson was not more strung out, that may have been his word, than she was, but as she explained it to us, and we nurtured her, but it was that Reeves was dead already, and he had died before that actual death. And, and that was how she was able to deal with it. I don't know what you asked me that re well, elicited that reply. <laughs> no, that's, that's very good. I'm glad, I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, 
and I don't mean to sound like I'm correcting you because you were told, I think you may have been told that by Tennessee Williams. Is that possible? It, well, do you know what I think that is? Who told me? So yes, it was Tennessee. The reason being Tennessee. is because Tennessee dramatized, or either Carson dramatized it when she told that story to Tennessee. Yes. And I remember because she said, Ten, honey, I looked down on the floor, and there was this coil of rope. And you know, and so then that was that was yes, that is the story. Can I can I tell you uh, John Ziegler and Edwin Peacock's version of that yes. same story? Oh yes. And I, he's, I'm looking he, at my watch. Yeah. He, 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 uh, oh, I have to be there. And was it quarter of four or quarter of five? Well, it's only quarter of four. Didn't I say four forty-five? Yeah. Yes. Okay, we're fine. Uh, John told me that she came to their Rita called them and said. Can Carson come stay with you? This was immediately after she found out. So it was, must have been before oh. she went to Augusta. Mm -hmm. And they said, of course. And she ended up staying with them for a month. And they deliberately avoided the subject of Reeves. And they just let her mm -hmm. you know, be with her thoughts. And he said that the story that Carson told them was that they were driving into the country. And Reeves told her that he was going to cut her tongue out. And he had a knife, not a rope. He was going to cut her tongue out, and she thought that he was going to kill her. And she, when they stopped, she ran into a bar and said, what's the word, the French word for hell? Secor? Secor. Secor. And someone took her to the airport from there. Oh, how interesting. And, and he said there was no rope. Mm -hmm. that, that, was the, that he knew that that was the story she had told Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And that Tennessee put his own twist to it. Mm. Uh, well, you see, I find it difficult to believe that he would cut her tongue out, even that he would tell her that that's what he was going to do. Because I don't think that's in keeping with this idea of the rope and when he hanged him, tried to hang himself from the pear tree, I think, and when he pointed up. Now there again, it depends on whose story it is, since exactly. Carson couldn't tell us herself. But I don't think it's in keeping, no matter what Carson said about, you know, he was going to cut my tongue out, um, to be a mute, a mute. <laughs> but I do think that Carson went first because Paula Snelling, Lillian Smith being dead, and Paula Snelling said we put her on the bus to Augusta. And that she did go to, and, and Cleckley, whom I talked with, you know, described the way, way she was. And they must have put her on the bus then, or took her or to, to South Carolina, to Charleston. I think that's, because that would be a much more, I mean, I think that was what she needed. So, You're right. John may not be remembering um, that she had come from Augusta first. Well, the other uh, goes through this. Uh, the other uh, conflicting story that I have um, that Carson and Reeves, at, at different points in their relationship, were not only uh, emotionally and mentally abusive to each other, but physically. Mm -hmm. Did anyone talk about that? No. Who talked about that? Um, well, the first person that I asked about this was Jordan Massey, and he said that if Reeves had ever hit her, she, po she possibly would have killed him, or she never would have stood for that. That would have been the complete end to it. Mm -hmm. But John Brown says that they threw things at each other, and when they couldn't hit each other, they would hit their dog. Hmm. I find that difficult to believe. I really do. I mean, knowing knowing Carson as I knew her, and knowing Reeves, I just feel like that's not. I mean, in anger, there might have been something thrown, but I mean, they love those dogs. I cannot imagine being abusive. Now, John, that was um, John Brown who said that. What happened to the dogs after Carson left and Reeves died? I'd be curious to know. I've never... Uh, didn't Carson send for the dogs? I never heard that. I never knew her to have those dogs in, in Nyack. 
I'll find out. I do know that I do know that there is an answer to that question. Okay. But because I have heard that uh, either Carson arranged for somebody to take them, or they she maybe she had already arranged for that because Before she had arranged for her things to be shipped from from Bashvier to her before Reeves, after Reeves mm -hmm. left, he just abandoned the house, mm -hmm. possibly that day. And and Janet Flanner uh, paid for his hotel. And mm -hmm. one thing that surprises me, I, I went to the hotel uh, thinking that it would be a dive, and it was it was a very fine hotel. Which hotel was it, do you recall? Uh, hotel, I, I have a card from the hotel, I have uh -huh. photos there. And, Everything, uh, but I cannot remember. The I effect. wonder if that were the hotel that Carson was staying in when Paul Bowles visited her. On the left bank. Uh, with, on the left bank, uh huh. Um, and I would, I just don't remember the name right now. But. I, I don't either, but uh, but Janet Flanner invested a lot of money mm -hmm. in Reeves, obviously. Because uh, even back then it would have been an expensive hotel. Okay, did anybody mention uh, the fact that Reeves had uh, a sexual thing with uh, um, Bessie and Henry's daughter who no. just died, that, that he had, that that was one of the reasons that, that Mrs. Poor, Bessie, she went by Bessie Brewer, Bessie Brewer Poor, um, that she really didn't want to talk with me because Reeves had abused their daughter. Or he had sex with their daughter. He wasn't abused. He had sex with her. And of course, that's nothing that I would you know, need to put in the book. Wish to put in the book. But I was sorry that she died. And her obit was in the New York Times maybe a month ago, I guess. I thought it was interesting. I do know that uh, Ellen Wright tells the story of they broke off the friendship because Reeves kept coming on to Ellen. Oh, really? And that's the reason. In fact, that's in the new Richard Wright biography hmm. that they stopped being friends because they could keep his hands off of Ellen. In his new biography? See, I haven't read it. I haven't seen the new biography yet. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. But there's, uh, let me, since we're running short of time, let me get to a couple of uh, questions. Okay. Let me change the angle here in just a second. So. Oh, actually, that's still a good angle. Okay. <laughs> um, why do you think that there's a, a, a resurgent interest, or there's probably more interest in Carson now than it, in any time since uh, the late 50s? Even when the movies were produced in the, in the middle 60s. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that, that she's been written about, so I mean, there have been not only that play, you know, the historically inaccurate Carson McCullers, there, first of all, was my biography, which really did have a long shelf life. It's only been in the last several years that it's been unavailable, except people can find it on the internet. Uh, certainly, um, I mean, she appears on reading lists, on college level classes. I think that uh, my friend Mary Robbins said that uh, that one of McCullough's novels was on a reading list when she was at uh, Illinois Wesleyan. I mean, I just do think that more and more uh, that there is this well, people, are, people are readers despite the prevalence of television. <laughs> I mean, there's still readers, and the people who are being read are one, I mean, the top writers right now. But, you know, they still go back and they read McCullers. They read Hemingway. They read Fitzgerald. Uh, they read Eudora Welty. Uh, Flannery O'Connor. And I, I don't think those writers are ever going to, to be without a strong readership. But McCullers, you know, I think the... the there's a certain warmth to McCullers that has come through biographically and from testimonies uh, from people who knew her. I mean, the, the kinds of things that we've talked about today uh, convinced me that, that she had some marvelous, warm friendships and that that has come through. And I mean, it has come through in the novels. There's this great sensitivity in the novels. You can't read her. You can't read Clock Without Hands, for example, even though... 
structurally it's not her best novel by any means, but some of the best writing is in it. And you've got people like Jordan Masters, who talks about his cousin, and their, their very loving relationship. He could you know, get angry at him, want to shake a stick at her, but of course he wouldn't, and she would do the same with him. Um, other than what I've just said, I, I can't explain it, except that uh, the various forms of media now make her, I mean, it's a wonderful story. Her life, sad though it is, it's a wonderful story to tell. And she didn't view her life as sad. I know, I know. I mean, and what she wanted, for example, and I remember Jack Fuller Love telling me this, that at the American Hospital, when she would go there for her week of checkups, and Reeves might be in one room, and she'd go down the hall, two rooms, and crawl in bed with Jack Fuller and she didn't want sex, he said, and, but, and that wasn't his inclination anyway, to have sex with her, but as he said, she just wanted a warm body, a, to snug up with her, and, and to kiss her and assure her that everything was all right. She needed that assurance. Yes, Jack, tell me, everything's gonna be all right. And, just, and then, of course, she gave me these sort of wet, sloppy kisses, and I didn't particularly like that. <laughs> but um, that's what she knew. Well, you think she got that from her mother, obviously, the need. Because mm -hmm. we, we don't have time to go into uh, her wonderful mother today, but uh, that's something that I think really needs to be explored. I think so, too, and those uh, stories that were published... Uh, by Rita after Carson's death. I guess they were in the mortgaged heart and then several came out just in the magazines. Um, those unpublished pieces. There was a side of how dependent Carson was of her mother and the love that she had and that really hasn't been explored enough biographically and I think, I mean, that would be a great topic for one of my doctoral students who's looking for her own. A, you know, something for his uh, or her dissertation. Um, yeah, I'm sure I didn't know Marguerite. I am too. I am too. That's quite an interesting lady. In fact, I have some great, great comments about her. I think your bird is letting us know that they're not. Well, happy. darling, I suppose I can uh, I can cover them right there. Yeah, I have two I have more them. questions for you. Let me just put this over. Do you mind doing No, of course not. Now listen, sweetheart. We've spoken for an hour, so that's, uh, that, that's I've got. I have some good copy, and then I know what oh, things okay. are down the right. line. But right well, listen, now, I want you all to just behave. You hear me? And we're going to close this up. You don't have to have the light. Can I turn this one off? This light. Yeah. And that will make me much quieter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, because oh, it's still good. Okay. Oh, that's much better. Good. There's going to be some events later on in the year that you will be involved in. And we're going to be bringing as many people in the McCullers world together, uh, both that were part of her life and were influenced by her. And... Um, and we're going to be trying to bring McCullers to a much wider audience. Uh, besides, she's a cult writer now. Even though she's well sold, mm -hmm. her, her books are all still in print. The movies are still available, and the movies are still watched and influential. She, as an artist and a writer, and she truly was an artist, not just a writer, but yes. what she wrote was art. Um, do you, to me, the time is right for Carson McCullers. Oh, I think so, too. And do you think that, uh, that the world is ready for Carson McCullers? Oh, yes. I think the world has been ready for a long time. And it's just taking the media that is available now and has been created to reveal the Carson that, who did exist. And will ex and will continue to exist through her work and her letters and and documentaries.
Okay, now let me. There's two particular questions. I don't have my notes out. Let's see. Um, let's see. I did ask you if you felt if you felt like you had to get away from McCullers, mm -hmm. but you, I don't think you. I, I'll let you clearly yeah. answer that. I mean, did you feel like you had to purge yourself? No, I didn't. I never felt I had to purge myself. I merely had to shift my focus to another biographical subject with whom I, I became very much involved uh, as a writer and had her family cooperate. I mean, I went from being the biographer without the cooperation of the estate to uh, of a woman to a biographer of a man who had a widow and a child and a stepson who cooperated with me. And then, of course, to Paul Bowles, who cooperated with me, and had it not been for Carson McCullers, and their living, Paul and Jane living in the house at 7 Mid Oak Street, you know, I wouldn't, and I had corresponded with Paul Bowles, I wouldn't have got onto a Bowles biography as I did, had it not been for Tennessee Williams, regardless of his romanticizing his memories of Carson. I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I wouldn't be a chairman of an English department as I was when I came to Georgia State University. And Carson McCullers launched me. I mean, it was a petard that I could never have anticipated. And you, you had a, a good friendship with Tennessee Williams. I did, and you know, he wrote the introduction to my biography of Carson. Did he, did he ever share anything with you? Well, what's really interesting to me is when I was out doing research in California uh, at the uh, library, I guess I was at, uh, at, at USC, and there was a cache of letters that, in fact, it was all of the work that had gone into Donald Spoto's biography of Tennessee Williams. And so I thought,